Good evening. Welcome to worship. Our colors have changed. Uh, we had green all the way up until this point for Epiphany. Green is the color of, of growth, green and growing, uh, to remind us that Jesus in every age and every stage of his life lived for us and kept God's law for us. Our colors have changed. It's white. White is the color for holiness. Uh, and so this morning, or rather this evening, we have this amazing ability then to get a glimpse of heaven itself. And we're going to need that. Because in the weeks that follow, we're going to see not that which is full of glory, but instead that which is, is gory. Uh, we're going to see a Savior beaten and bloodied and bruised for us. And so on the front side, before we get into the middle of, of the difficult times of Lent and Jesus suffering and dying for us, at the very uh, tail end of Epiphany, we have this amazing glimpse of heaven to let us know uh, that Jesus had a plan and he came from heaven and he's returning to heaven. And all of that we get to see in our readings here uh, um, this evening, especially in our, our gospel for this evening. The order of service we follow he is setting three. Uh, we'll begin, though, with our opening hymn, hymn 405, On My Heart and Print Your Image. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all your sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be our redeemer and savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. We speak together the prayer of the day. O oh God, in the glorious transfiguration of your only begotten son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. And in the voice that came from the bright cloud, you foreshadowed our adoption as your sons. In your mercy, make us co-heirs of glory with Jesus our King, and bring us at last to heaven 
through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with Psalm 67. Continue with the gospel acclamation. respect for the gospel. 
The gospel this evening is taken from Luke chapter 9. Uh, these words will also serve as our basis for our sermon this evening. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, uh, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We continue with our hymn of the day, hymn 388, Down from the Mount of Glory. Of 
Jesus Christ our Lord, and let the wondrous story full peace and joy afford. The holy mount acclaims him. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of our dear Savior, who is God from God, light from light. Look with your eyes, not with your hands. When I was a child, the, the teachers uh, had us walk through show and tell, so you would bring a, a prized pet, a prized toy, and you would do just that. You would show it and you would tell. You would speak about it. Great idea. But there was this huge flaw in the whole procedure for show and tell. The huge flaw in it is that we are created with senses. And we want not to see things from afar. We, we want to see them up close. And so sometimes, even right after the child was, was um, done talking about show and tell, uh, there'd be the student who would, the, the fellow classmate who would say, let me see it. And we all know what that means, right? Let me see it means, can I have it in my hands, have it, hold it, touch it, know it, smell it, whatever it is, right? Up close and personal. And what does the snarky classmate say? Look with your eyes, not with your hands. <laughs> right? This evening, we have the same truth. God reveals his glory. Heaven comes to earth. What an amazing thought. And we're going to see very quickly then uh, uh, the disciples that Jesus brings onto this mountain. They want to see this glory, not from far away. They want to see it up close and tangibly touch it but it doesn't work out that way. In Luke 9, we read these words. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. So the, the context leading into these words is that Jesus, in, in the verse right before this, Jesus has said, there's going to be a small number of you who, before you die, will see the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Jesus uh, uses that phrase, especially all in, in the gospel according to Luke, uh, the word king in them there does not mean boundaries and borders and bricks and mortar. Uh, it talks, it, it's an activity, Jesus ruling, ruling in, in our hearts by the Holy Spirit through his word. But then there are some times, and this is one of those examples, where uh, we get to see the goal of where that ruling finally leads to is heaven itself. And Jesus says there's going to be some of you who are going to see that. A tiny slice, a little glimpse of heaven. And eight days later, that's exactly what happens. Uh, Jesus takes a small number, Peter, James, and John, as they're some kind, sometimes called the inner three. He takes them up onto the mountain. And there, first of all then, there are people that appear. Moses and Elijah appear. You kind of put yourself in, in, in the sandals of a, a believer in Jesus' day. And if you put together a top ten list of these are the people I want to talk to, Moses and Elijah would have been there at the top of the list. I mean, you, you picture Moses. There is the guy who, who, is, who is there with the, the ten plagues. Let my people go. 
He was the guy through whom the, the Red Seas were parted and they went through on dry land. He was the one who had this amazing ministry. What an amazing privilege it would be to, to, to talk about all the events that happened in the book of Genesis and Exodus from the one who was there. This amazing glimpse of heaven. Or Elijah. Um, Elijah th is this amazing prophet who had all of these uh, uh, amazing miracles, one after another. Uh, just to give you one example, there's the, the miracle where he's staying with the widow of Zarephath, and after a while, the widow's son dies, and he prays, and, and the young man is brought back to life. I mean, how many, how many um, parents lost their children through death, and they might pray the Lord bring their child back, and it wasn't answered like that, was it? Before Elijah, it was. What would it have been like to be able to sit down with Elijah and, and, and talk through that, but this show and tell us from afar. And, and you have to picture it. You, you got Peter, James, and John here. And then separated from them at a distance is Moses and Elijah. And so there are person, there are people who appear. Um, Elijah and Elisha, uh, Elijah, sorry, and Moses, right? But then there are also the persons that, are, that, that appear. Uh, Jesus uh, reveals the glory that for the most part he hides on the inside, shines out a little bit more, uh, flashing like lightning. And not just Jesus then, uh, there's the voice from heaven, God the Father is there. In a very wondrous and amazing way, it's not just earthly people now in heaven who come down to earth. It's the persons of the Trinity. They come down too. This amazing, again, in a certain sense, to bar the picture, this amazing show and tell, this amazing glimpse of glory. Well, then what happens? We read, Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus, Peter, said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. So the people appear, and the persons of the Trinity appear. And what's Peter's reaction? Peter panics. And again, you've got you to put yourself in Peter's shoes. Again, uh, visually kind of picture the distance. He's over here with James and John. And then there's Jesus over here with Elijah and Moses. And they're talking, and they're talking, and they're talking. And he's waiting then. Peter's waiting for his turn to be able to speak with Elijah and Moses. And they keep talking and talking. And time is running out. And then what happens? Moses and Elijah then, they are separated farther from them, and Peter realizes his time has run out, and he panics. I remember when I was a, a child, I, you know, this reading, of course, if you've been a Lutheran for any amount of time, it pops up every single year, right? And I remember when I was a child, I remember thinking um, that the pastors sometimes would, they, 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 it would be irresistible to talk about how dumb Peter was. Peter, come on! unrealistic, right? Camp there on, on this mountain. You're going to put up some tents. Where are you going to get the tents from? But Peter was far more all together than we give him credit for because he was grasping at a huge issue that we, that we wrestle with in our, own, in our everyday life. Ever since the fall into sin, time itself is twisted. Time itself, ever since the fall into sin, is not our ally, it's our enemy. He had a small amount of time, a window of opportunity to speak with Moses and Elijah, and he was waiting ever so patiently, and then that time was torn from him. In our lives, we walk through the same difficulty, don't we? Where we have time, this amazing gift, but we don't appreciate it like we should. Or even worse, instead of not appreciating it, we actually squander the time that we have. 
And that's what life is like, as King Solomon would say, life under the sun in our sinful world. What example would you use? What, uh, what analogy would you borrow? It's like the, the mom who raises her tiny boy and then she reads stories to him and he gets older and then she watches movies um, with him. You know, buys like the entire Disney or Star Wars collection or Lord of the Rings and watches it with him. Um, she, he gets older and gets into high school, then what does she do? She goes in the minivan and she drives him from one place to another. At least there, in that setting, she's able to talk with him. He graduates from high school, goes a couple states away to college, and then Christmas comes along and she's looking forward. She's looking forward to that time when he will come home and they'll be able to sit down maybe around the Christmas tree in the fireplace and catch up. And what happens? He comes home, eats the food, and goes off and visits with all of his friends. Normal, natural stuff. And yet she asks the question, right? Where did all the time go? And then from that question, then there's the, the, other, the other question. She's able to look back in her life and realize there were times I had with my son and I can think about some of those examples, and I squandered that time. Or the granddaughter. The granddaughter who lives, uh, uh, you know, many states away, and she goes once a year to visit her grandma, and her grandma is just amazing and unique. There's no one like her. She goes to grandma's house, and grandma has these religious pictures on her wall, the types of which she has not seen any other place. And she goes there, and, and, and grandma explains what these pictures of Jesus and, uh, are on the wall, and she cherishes her time with grandma, and then one of the years, grandma dies. And all of a sudden, she's robbed, robbed of time with grandma. Ever since the fall into sin, time itself is twisted. And we can make fun of Peter, but at the very least, he's grappling with the real issue that we wrestle with in our everyday life, time that he wanted so desperately, that this little grasping and glimpse of heaven, the show and tell was quickly fading away and there was nothing he can do about it. And my dear friends, let, let's be open and honest. The world around us uh, has the same problems that we have, but they have no solution to it. No solution whatsoever. Uh, you take, for example, the Eastern religions. Uh, um, there's, in, in the last 10 years especially, there's been this rekindling of this idea of living in the present, awareness. And a lot of that is so good. But some of that is not healthy at all, and the reason why is there's this huge focus on the present because, you know, they don't, don't, want, don't want to let you know that they're, in their religion, the future isn't exactly all that bright. Karma, for example, is this idea that um, as you treat others, so also it's going to stack up against you or, or in your favor. And if you do enough good with others, well, you might be another human being. But the chances are um, you're not going to be good enough. And when you die, you're going to get rebirthed and reincarnated. You know, you could be a bug. You could be a slug. Put that on your brochure. So what's the, what's the response? We're just going to put our blinders on and not talk about the future. We're just going to live in the present. You know, that's, that's, you know, over there across the seas, in our own land, it's a little bit different. Uh, there's the modern um, uh, religion of, of, of macroevolution. You know, that over bajillions of years, we slowly changed and, and uh, became more complex organisms and such. Um, and, and it's changed um, even worse into this grandiose sort of religion. A, a couple years ago, I watched um, the Star Wars movie Rogue One with my daughters. And in that movie, there's a, a, a dad who is separated from his daughter. And he picks out for her this cherished name for her which is a big deal in the movie. He calls her Stardust, because after all, again, according to evolution, you know, we're all made of stardust. I mean, think that through for a minute. You're, you're, you're dirt, you're dust, you have this existence right now and you die and you cease to, uh, to exist and you're just dirt, you're dust. So what's the solution to it? Well, you dress it up. 
You rebrand it. You don't just say that it's dust. It's not dust, it's stardust. Well, that makes it all, all that much so better, right? Stardust, it's pretty. That means there's a meaning and there's hope and there's not. All of a sudden then, when you combine time with the whole idea of people, we realize the world around us has no answer to the question and no solution to the problem. Peter, at least, grappled with the issue. Peter, at least, recognized that these two cherished people that he wanted to, to talk with and sit down with and have up close, they were being separated from him, torn away by time itself. The words continue. <clears throat> we read, while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. So, the father appears in the cloud. And what does he do? And this is kind of neat to think about. You put yourself in, in, in the Father's shoes for a minute. I mean, if I were there, I mean, I might have the, the temptation to say, again, Jesus' face is, is shining gloriously and radiantly. If I were the Father, I, I might, um, in his, his shoes, I would say, look at him. This is my son, my beloved son, my chosen son. Look at him. That's not what the Father says. The Father doesn't say, look at him. The Father says, listen. Listen to him. Well, listen to what? Earlier on in, in the words, again, you got to picture it. Peter, James, and John are over here. Jesus and Elijah and Moses, Moses are, over, are over here. And what are Jesus, Moses, and Elijah talking about? They are talking about Jesus' exodus, is the word, his departure, his leaving. Moses and Elijah were encouraging Jesus and rejoicing in Jesus that now the, the journey was just about at the end. And this is all good news. Why? Um, what's the content and main focus of the good news? Jesus was leaving. On that holy Thursday night, that's exactly what happened, right? Jesus left. Strike the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. Jesus is betrayed and he leaves his disciples. And hours later on Friday, he's crucified and he pays for their sins. Yes, even their sins that uh, Peter, James, and John uh, committed when they didn't appreciate the time that they had and even worse, squandered it. And you know what? The same is true for us. And the Father says, listen to that. And Jesus left not just to die, but also to prepare a place for us. And in John 14, um, again, this takes place on, on a Monday, Thursday night, uh, Jesus says, I'm leaving you. I'm going there to my Father to prepare a place for you. And that, my dear friends, is an amazing thought that, you know, Jesus rises from the dead, ascends into heaven, and what is he doing? He's preparing a place for you and for me. And what is that place like? It's a place where time is no longer our enemy. It's a place where time forever is our friend. There on the, right here, right now, time is this tortured, twisted thing that we don't appreciate it very often, and we very often squander it. But there on the other side in heaven, we have all the time in the universe forever. What an amazing gift that our Lord gives us, again, because he leaves us. He leaves to go and die. He leaves to prepare a place for us. And that means our sins are forgiven and there's a place for us in heaven. And then, finally then, he leaves us with one final invitation to be able then 
to live our lives knowing that we can have a present awareness right now and have a restful present. Why? Because we have a secure future. We don't need to change dust to stardust and pretend that there's, you know, and focus just on the now because we know what the future holds. And that frees us then to be able to live right here, right now. And for the closing minute or two of, of our sermon, we'll talk about that. What does it look like to live each day as Jesus gives to us. At the end of, um, tail end of Matthew 6, Jesus says, uh, do not, uh, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, these are words, a long section of scripture, and as a pastor, I, I never get down to these words. I never get down to them, and, because there's so much other good stuff to focus on, but I love these words, um, because first of all, Jesus is kind of snarky, if you think about it. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. Why? It's tomorrow's job to worry about itself. Hmm. Kind of interesting. And then he backs it up even more so, and he says, um, uh, you know, don't worry about tomorrow because today we'll have enough, and the word there is trouble, but uh, it could very well also be translated um, as it normally is, is, is uh, evil. You're going to have enough evil today. Why worry about the evil tomorrow? And how wonderful it is then to know that today Jesus is here with us. And because he left us, our sins are forgiven today. And because he left us, there is this secure place in heaven forever where time is our ally, not our enemy. What an amazing present that is. Let us then as, as we bump into these today moments, you know, moment by moment, reclaim them because they are ours. We will have these invitations then. When Jesus says, listen to my son, to be able then to go in our own hearts and say, today I will praise you. Today I will listen to you. Today I will pray to you, O Lord. Today I will open up my Bible and read it. Uh, today I will study God's word. Today I will hear this sermon. Today I will pray to you. Oh, I said that already, didn't I? What's the point? These amazing invitations, yeah, to be right here, right now, in the present, aware, and take advantage of even the present that is reclaimed for us. So, show and tell, right? I'll end where I began. Uh, and when you're a tiny kid, you, you want this ability then to be able to have and hold and touch up close. And Jesus doesn't say that. He says, we get to have show and tell. Uh, we're going to be able to give Jesus a big hug and, and, and like Thomas, put our hands in the side. Then, then, when the Lord calls us home, show and tell isn't now. Right now, what our Lord invites us to do is to listen to him speaking to us through his word. For he leaves us to pay for our sin, and he leaves us to prepare a place for us in heaven. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> we continue by saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We gather our thank offering and, and move right into our Bible study.
Okay, here we are. Um, can you go back a slide? Oh, we, we can't. No, you cannot. Okay, um, so we were talking about um, uh, 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 difficulties when it came to abusive situations as we find them in the context of Jonah. Uh, 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 this, uh, stage number one would be separation and safety, um, and you, you find a huge example of that with Joseph. By the way, we also find that um, with, with Jesus. I read a, a couple weeks ago this beautifully written article um, that talks about is, is the Christian thing to do to run away? And um, the, the uh, writer of the uh, uh, um, article did a beautiful job of showing how often Jesus ran away. We, I mean, we call them Jesus withdrawals, and, and he does them a lot. So um, there's this uh, importance of being separated from uh, uh, the, the, the tragedies that are happening. Also disentanglement, uh, the separation um, ha has to happen first so that then the disentanglement, um, sorting out the truth from the lies, can begin to happen. Um, and if you want examples of that, l read those first 50 Psalms, especially the ones where King David is running away from King Saul. Um, the times when his closest friends or, you know, his fellow believers, we would say today, members of my own church and family, um, you know, they, they turned their backs on him and went against him. Uh, another part of this is acceptance, um, being able to simply admit in our own hearts um, the truth. Yeah, this happened to me. And then finally then, um, forgiveness. Now, um, Forgiveness as a practice, not a process. Oh, okay. Forgiveness as a practice, not a process. Um, so if you were to read like modern day, um, oh, what's the word, uh, like articles, American Psychological Association type stuff, uh, it's fascinating how they look at forgiveness. They look at forgiveness like this. Um, you prove to me over the span of time that you're worthy of being forgiven. And if you do that long enough, you build up enough trust in me, and then I will forgive you. Let that um, kind of stew in your crock pot cooker in your brain for a second. You, uh, let's, you've done something bad to me, maybe a big, a huge bad thing, or a number of medium-sized things again and again over the span of time. Our relationship is severed, it's broken. And what forgiveness looks like to them is over time, if you do enough good things and, and prove yourself worthy, then I will forgive you. I'll treat you like my kids in catechism class. I'll put you on, on I'm not gonna ask if it's right or wrong. I'm telling you there's weaknesses. Now you tell me, what are the weaknesses in that? What are the weaknesses in that? Yeah, Miss Endorf. Yeah, ooh, 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 good. Okay, you went in a different direction there at the end, but, and I like it. So first of all, are any of us worthy of being forgiven? Aha, uh -huh. okay. That's all by grace. Um, but the other part of it then is, is um, you know, what's in the heart. I, um, I suppose there could be a scenario where I'm doing all the right things, I gain your trust again, and I'm, I'm you know, not genuine or sincere. Um, uh, 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 and I had a, a guy who put it this way. Um, he said, forgiveness is not a process. You know, when you're worthy enough, I'll forgive you. Instead, it's a practice. Oh, practice. You know, we're, um, Karen, she, she got um, Peacock, the app, so, she, so we could watch, you know, the Winter Olympics. And um, you think of the practice the Olympians go into. You know, for years, they're, they're you know, training their bodies, and it's an everyday thing that you do. And you know what? When you go on and you exercise, some, day, some days you have good days when you exercise because it's a practice, and other days you don't have as much success. I think that's a far more biblical picture because it describes what our lives of forgiveness are like. When someone has hurt you, you know, again, not stealing your pencil or your favorite um, a piece of gum. I mean, something big, something that really gets to you right? Um, uh, 
I was joking with the fifth and sixth graders how Miss Endorf has this prized, amazing red swing line stapler, you know, on her desk, and don't take that because I'm sure that's a big ticket item. She'd get angry at um, at you. That wouldn't that wouldn't be an easy forgiveness item. That'd be a more difficult one probably. Um, but when when that hurt happens, there are going to be days um, when you're able then, with all honesty, to say, "I forgive you," because after all, Christ has forgiven me. And there are going to be other days when it's just tough. It's just tough. And there are going to be some days where you, you know, flip-flop all over the place even in, within one day. Um, and it's important for us to recognize that. That's normal. That's natural. Um, uh, but before you get to the, even the ability to work on forgiveness as a practice, the other things need to be there first. If you're in the middle of, 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 of a, uh, I don't know, a relationship, a situation with someone where um, it's just one bad scenario after another, it's hard to be in a situation where you can work on forgiveness when, um, as Jesus, as you talked about last week, produce fruit in keeping in, within repent, keeping in, in repentance. There, there isn't any fruit of that. It's hard, isn't it? So this is not easy to, to, to walk through because it's not easy to understand. And it's also not easy because it's not easy to do, is it? But it's important to talk about it because that's what Jonah's going through. Again and again and again, now um, a number of times, he's told to go to Nineveh, preach the gospel, this amazing gospel of forgiveness. The Lord forgives them. Does Jonah forgive them? No. And he gets angry at the Lord because the Lord has actually forgiven them. Um, and it's something that we wrestle with. We, you know, we want to forgive those who are kind and nice to us, but not those who are mean to us. But again, as we spoke about last week, just because we forgive them, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that we're going to buy a house in the neighborhood right next to them and, and, and grill out with them all the time. You know, there still might be that need for, for safety and separation. There's a lot on that little, um, little uh, slide there, isn't there? So I want to pause and give you a chance to kind of, if you have some questions to ask, you know, you're, you're, you're welcome to do so. I, I took a continuing education class on adult education, and they said um, when you ask questions inside your brain, you need to count to five. Because if you say, are there any questions, then you wait for a half a second and, and then move on. People get angry. For some reason, people get angry with you after a while. So we kind of pause. You know, one, two, three four, five. Now I'm a good adult teacher because I've waited five seconds, right? Um, okay. Uh, um, I want you to kind of think, think that through a little bit in Jonah's situation and also in, in your own. Okay, moving on. Next slide. Um, uh, now, Lord, take away my life for it is better for me to die than to live. Hmm. So notice how, how Jonah kind of, um, we're going to see, he mentions this a couple times, actually. We're going to see with Jonah this fascinating pattern where, um, in a certain sense, he doubles down. He becomes more hardened and more resolved in his um, anger at God and his hatred toward the Ninevites. Okay? And then he says, um, so much so that he says, it's... It, it, I'd rather die than live. And that brings up some, some important questions for us to, um, to walk through. I mean, before we move to the next slide, I, I remember um, uh, Professor Brugge used to say, every part of the Bible is true, but not every part of the Bible is, um, is fit for your first graders in Sunday school. True, right? Um, in the book of Jonah, you know, the, the, when I was in Sunday school, man, we got to color pictures of whales and stuff. But when this, we got to this part, it's better for me to die than to live. I never had a Sunday school teacher who touched this. Not a chance, right? <laughs> Leave that for the pastor. We're paying him money. But there is a place for it. Do you think that um, just grown-ups have bad days or bad years? Um, little kids do too. And it's important for us to talk about it. Okay, so, so Jonah says, it's better for me to die than to live. Next slide. Jonah prayed for death. Is it okay for Christians to pray for death? 
Let you ponder that question just for a tiny second. Now, if I had an hour Bible study, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe have a little more time to let you ponder it, but kind of think that through. Is it okay for Christians um, to pray for death? Um, let's look at some Bible passage. Okay, next slide. So this is uh, Philemon, or is it Philippians? Philippians. Um, Join together in, in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Continue. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Ooh, that's one of my favorite passages whenever I have a funeral and especially the committal service. Um, you know, we're better off in Gibbon because we can walk to our cemetery. You poor fools have to drive to your cemetery. I'm, I'm joking, hope you understand that. Um, uh, the, the, um, but the, the Christian committal service is amazing. And the longer I'm a pastor, the more I, I, I appreciate it. Why? Because in the funeral sermon, you get to say, this person believed in, in Jesus, this person is now in heaven. And you walk over to the committal service and, and you lay your loved one's remains to rest, whether it's ashes or it's the, um, the body, you put the person in the ground, and, and the beautiful words, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of all flesh, and you get to say these words, God will transform uh, this lowly body to be like Jesus' glorious resurrected body. Oh, man, doesn't get any better than that, right? And then I, 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 with my own people over the years, I sing, um, Lord, when your glory I have, um, Lord, when your glory I shall see, that beautiful hymn, um, and, and um, I, I told my people in Pennsylvania that at, at, um, my goal was to have you have such a hard time singing that just as, as I do, because you can't, I can't sing that hymn anymore without tearing up because I've buried too many people. And sure enough, you know, it was one of those things like, you've ruined that hymn for me, Pastor Bauer. And that's my goal for my own Gibbonites, too, to make it much the same thing. I love that hymn. I mean, can you, um, I can't sing Abide With Me much anymore for the same reason. Now, why am I saying all of this? It is normal, it is natural to yearn for heaven. And along with that, then, there are going to be days in our lives when we see the full brunt and weight and effect of sin, and we just want to be done. We want to be in heaven. And let's face it, um, unless, Jesus delays, unless Jesus comes on judgment day, what's the path to heaven? It's through death. So there is a way that we can um, openly and honestly talk about the fact that it's okay um, to yearn for heaven on the one hand, okay? Um, but on the other hand, next slide. Um, right, next slide. Um, see now that I myself am he. This is Deuteronomy. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded, and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. Aha. So you might yearn for death, and there might be some times that might be valid and properly so. Who's the one who, make, who gets to make the call, though? I bring to life, and I put to death. Whose role is it? Oh, come on, you can answer the question. Yeah, our God above, it, it, it's his role, isn't it? Um, he brings us to life, and it's his role to, um, to put us to death, right? Um, and there's where you get to some, some um, difficult scenarios. Um, and I'm going to, um, you know, if you have, like, younger children and you want to take them out, I suppose you could, but I don't think this is beyond their reach for understanding. Um, there can be sometimes uh, it's so difficult in our lives it's not just that we, we, we might pray for death, it's that we, we plan it out and um, dream of ways of accomplishing that because life is so tough. 
Um, and especially in those situations, we need to be aware of, of people who are in those situations and spend time with them um, in the ashes, grieving with them, uh, um, because the Lord is the one who brings to life and puts to death. Um, well, you know, we're leading into Lent, and you have um, the, whenever suicide comes up in the Bible, it's never um, uh, an optimistic pitch, uh, picture. Um, we have at least three examples that I know of in the Bible, maybe four, three examples. And they're, they're all examples of people who, as an expression of unbelief, um, as an expression of unbelief, um, put themselves to death. Okay? Now, having said that, um, there are also examples where um, and we know this from biology, and, and we can find sometimes examples if we, if we look um, in, in the Bible where, where our, um, the, the way I've described it is our, our bodies betray us. Like in times of trauma, if people go through very difficult times, they want to die, and then their bodies begin to urge them on. I think of our veterans. I think of some um, women I've, I've counseled uh, after they've had their, their children with postpartum depression. Um, and there might be a scenario where uh, someone um, commits suicide, but not in the um, Judas scenario as an expression of unbelief, but instead uh, as an example of where their body betrayed them. Um, sometimes that's with clinical depression. Other times that's with um, medication where they might change and, and, and it changes their, their personality. Um, and in those situations, we want to be very kind and patient. And that's why, you know, in a certain sense, it's a blessing on the one hand to have all of our congregations like 9.5 miles spread out from each other. That seems to be the pattern, right? Every nine or eight miles, you get a New Wells congregation. But there's also a curse in that, in that you might have one church where there's a suicide and the pastor says, no, I'm not going to bury that person. And you might have another situation where there's a, a congregation that says, yeah, we're going to bury that person. Well, it might be a different context. It might be in one scenario that uh, the person, like Judas, um, commits suicide as an expression of unbelief. And in the next one, it might be a situation where we, we honestly just don't know. And so we commit the person into the hands of a loving and gracious creator. Jonah is not afraid at all to say, I would rather die than live. And if he brings that up as a, a, a prophet and just as a normal person, can't we talk about that? Can't we bring up the topic of the fact that there are going to be times when we'd rather die than live? That's what our Christian life looks like on some dark days. But there's more to it, isn't there? There's, there's hope uh, there's promises from God. And then there's also, of course, um, medical, biological help to get. You know, uh, um, in the same way that our bodies uh, can fall apart. You know, I cut myself or whatever it is, I get cancer, you get treatment. Um, the nervous system, is, it, it can be the same way. I had a relative, um, you know, he had clinical depression. And it was amazing to me that no matter what you would say to lift up his spirits, it didn't impact the cloud that he was in. He needed medical help, you know, um, and we need, we need to recognize that. And, uh, so, um, and again, if um, what we're talking about here, I, I do realize that some of this might not be, let's talk about this in front of a, a large group. I realize that. It's not going to be that scenario. But I do want to bring it up so that you're aware of it, so that you can, Lord willing, when Pastor um, Schleusner takes his call like he's supposed to, um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. You know, if there are issues that come up, you can sit down with him and walk through this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this is vitally important to talk about. And my fear is that if we never talk about this stuff, there's this irony. The world talks about this stuff all the time. But just like with the Star Wars movie and reincarnation, it's stupid sermons with the wrong context and the wrong conclusion. Um, shouldn't we who have the truth of God's word talk about this in, in the full Christian context? And maybe you not, might not be able to do it and, 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 and be like, oh, pastor, there was this one time, let me talk about it in Bible study. It may not be that, but 
Lord willing, when you get your pastor, and even if you need to sit down with me and talk about it, there's a time and place for that, and we, and we need to. Okay? Um, all right. All right. Um, moving on. Um, all right. Uh, uh, but notice there's a balance there. Um, oh, I, I had told Miss Endorf that, um, you know, we got 20 minutes, and, I, and we're like to the end of the book. We might be done, right? Right? Um, not a chance. Yeah. There's no way. So we'll um, um, we'll pick it up there next time, and we'll talk about um, um, uh, deathbed scenarios. Have I talked about that before? No, so maybe I haven't. I, I'm doing a lot of Bible studies right now, and sometimes I have deja vu. So we'll pick it up there, um, and we'll talk about the balance that we we, we uh, uh, have to have when it comes to end of life issues. Okay. Um, let me get my hymnal and figure out where we are. Oh, yeah, we're at our prayers, aren't we? So um, please stand. We'll continue with our prayers um, on uh, page 72. We're going to skip the short prayer. We're going to have a prayer for, um, for Ukraine um, tonight, and then we'll uh, uh, join together in the Lord's Prayer and then conclude with our blessing and our final hymn. We pray. Lord Jesus, we are now in the end times. And you have promised to us that soon judgment day will come, for all the promises and prophecies have been fulfilled. There are earthquakes, famines, and floods. And as we see in Ukraine, there are also wars and rumors of wars. With this in mind, we first of all pray that you would bring peace to Ukraine and Russia, the only way the true, lasting, and real peace can come. We pray that through your word, you would create faith in the hearts of the people in Ukraine and Russia, that peace with you would lead to, to people to be at peace with those around them, their neighbors. We also pray that you would watch over the people of Ukraine, send your holy angels to be with them, using even these evil events to end up in a good lasting result for them. Curb and hold away from the people of Ukraine the evil that the wicked people of this world have planned for them. As we see these events unfolding, lead us as we see these events to first of all repent of our own sins, and then lead us to look forward, for Judgment Day could come at any time. Lead us to recognize and realize that on that day, we will be able to lift up our heads in joy, for the heaven we have longed to see with our own eyes will be ours according to your gracious promises. All this we pray in your name and continue with the prayer you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We conclude with our final hymn, Speak, O Lord. Holy reverence.
sense, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail, let the truth prevail over all. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises. And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church your glory. Good evening. Um, are there any announcements? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Turning into a real. I'm not. The, see, I thought that was just a pastor problem, but it's a teacher issue too, huh? Yeah. Some teachers have that. Yeah. Uh, some teachers have that, huh? Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, um, so indeed, uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, and it's neat. Um, one of the things you see by having, you know, the, the brief 20 minutes in the middle of the service is how Bible study is different. It's different than a sermon. It's just different. Uh, a sermon is one directional where you take law and gospel and you apply it to the lives of, of the people. Good, holy, wondrous. Bible study is different. Bible study is this back and forth, this give and take, where um, we walk through parts of the Bible, or topics in the Bible, I suppose, too. But it's back and forth. And, and, and you get to do this thing where you actually get to ask questions. How neat, right? Um, uh, what a great gift on the study of God's Word is. Um, okay, uh, um, so uh, no announcements. Um, um, if that's the case, I, I pray that God will bless you richly as you rejoice in God's word this evening, uh, that our Father doesn't say, look at Jesus. Our show and tell is coming later on in heaven, and we look forward to that. Instead, he says, listen. Well, listen to what? In this context here in Luke 9, it's listen to Jesus leaving. He leaves to pay for our sins. He leaves to prepare a place for us in heaven, a place where time is no longer our, our enemy, but instead our ally. Amen. Amen.